Welcome to Policy Brief, an informed and engaging conversation with policymakers, policy influencers, and public sector professionals brought to you by the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at The Ohio State University. My name is Trevor Brown, proud to serve as Dean of the Glenn College, and I'm joined today by Drew Willison, currently a, a lawyer with a firm in Washington, D.C., but uh, a long distinguished career in public service. Uh, perhaps most notably, given the conversation we're going to have today, served as Chief of Staff uh, for uh, Senate, Major Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, and then ultimately became Sergeant of Arms of the U.S. Senate. Um, and so we're going to have a great conversation about um, how one protects the Capitol uh, and specifically talk about the, the U.S. Senate. Uh, but before we dive in, I should also, for truth and advertising, say that, that Drew is a graduate of the Glenn College, then the School of Public Policy and Management, carrying one of our graduate professional degrees. Drew, it's a pleasure to have you here. How are you doing today? I'm happy to be here. Doing well. Well, Drew, I, I want to start with a, with a simple kind of civics question. Um, what, what is the Sergeant of Arms, and uh, what does the Sergeant of Arms do? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, it depends a little bit on um, where in what organization you are the sergeant at arms. I was the sergeant at arms of the United States Senate, and before that I had been the deputy sergeant at arms. The primary mission of the Senate sergeant at arms is to protect members of the United States Senate and their staff and, their, and the Capitol building, as well as providing some security services in the, in the um, state and district offices uh, around the country. But unlike my counterpart in the House, the Sergeant at Arms in the Senate also runs an entire huge back of the house operation that sort of all the things you would need to keep sort of a large village uh, running. Everything from, from uh, information technology down through printing graphics and direct mail, uh, members send and get a lot of mail, uh, to other critical functions like that you don't think too much of, like a badge office or a um, who gets what parking and where and when, which is as controversial as you might think it is in a uh, relatively confined space, but and as well as the doorkeeper's office, the people who control ac access into the ch into and out of the chamber itself, uh, and a bunch of other different functions that um, that just if everything's going exactly right, um, people barely know we exist. Uh, after after last week, I think a lot more people are familiar with what, what a sergeant at arms is, and at least in the capital. And we're going to get to that, but I'm, I'm, I'm just fascinated by what seems like a fairly straightforward list of uh, duties and, and responsibilities, but I, I want to unpack that a little bit. Sure. So you mentioned that, that the back office functions don't exist in the sergeant at arms responsibility for the House. Why, why the difference? The House and Senate are very different, and they take their differences very, very seriously. Um, you know, there is a, there is a healthy Rivalry is probably a good way to put it uh, between the uh, the House and Senate. Um, I don't think as many people refer to the lower house as a bunch of savages anymore as they might have uh, some <laughs> periods. But um, they they grew up differently. They they handle things differently. Um, the the functions that the Senate Sergeant at Arms has are 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 spread out in a number a number of different organizations within the uh, the within the House, the Chief Administrative Officer and the the clerk of the house and a number of other jobs. It just spread around differently. So I like my job better. In a minute, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the the process of keeping the the capital both open and safe. Um, but but just paint a little bit more of the picture. What what kinds of law enforcement assets do you have as as sergeant at arms? How you know what portion of the the staff that work for you are in law enforcement? What authorities do they have? Sure. Uh, do they carry sidearms? Just just some of those basic nuts and bolts. Sure. The um, within the sergeant at arms organization itself, there are probably better part of fifty people who are dedicated to security related activities. Not all of which are directly law enforcement. Uh, there's there's safety uh, protocols for offices, the way to harden offices. You know, a lot of members have a lot of different spaces in in out in the states, and there's a need to get get those upgraded in such a way, particularly in commercial spaces to make them safe for the people who are in there. Uh, there's a small intelligence unit and, and a number of other people whose primary job is to be thinking about 
about the safeguarding and security planning for, for the institution. In many cases, if something were to go wrong and, they, and the Congress, particularly the Senate, wouldn't be able to meet. In addition to that, the, the Sergeant at Arms of the Senate and the Sergeant at Arms of the House with the architect of the Capitol, who's the, who's the chief building person, the person who takes care of the Capitol and the office buildings and things like furniture, uh, for, are, are also members of the Capitol Police Board. They form the Capitol Police Board. And through that, they have support and oversight of the U.S. Capitol Police, which is a police force of roughly 2,000 sworn officers who uh, protect uh, the, the sort of the square mile of Capitol Square. So the House, the Senate, the Senate office buildings, House office buildings, and, and the grounds, uh, they are responsible for protecting that area. It's a lot of officers, uh, the area, as, as we saw last week, although I don't think we saw it in the way I think anybody expected to, is, is a big terrorist threat. So uh, everybody takes it seriously, particularly in the post 9-11 era. It's a department of about 800 people before September 11th, and it's about 2,000 now. So considerable growth in, in the assets to defend the, the capital. Um, before we, we get to events of, of last week, how does one become Sergeant of Arms? Is it you know, posted in the newspaper and you just send in an application or, or, or how, do, how, does, how does one become the Sergeant at Arms? Yeah, there, there's no great way to put the, the, the buzzwords quite right that it's gonna pop up on your LinkedIn screen. Um, as, <laughs> of course, I shouldn't make fun of that. I just got an offer to be a job as a manager at a Wawa here, which is a 7-Eleven kind of thing here in, in Washington. <laughs> so I clearly need to do some work with my resume back here. But um, no, the, the majority leader of the United States Senate appoints the, has basically has four patronage jobs um, that he, he or she is able to dole out. The Sergeant at Arms, the Deputy Sergeant at Arms, the Secretary of the Senate was in charge of a lot of the, the back of the House legislative functions in the Senate and the Assistant Secretary. Everybody else in all of these bureaucracies stays um, throughout change in administration, change in leader, change in, in you know, the leader, them, him or herself, or the party that is, is in the majority in the Senate. Um, just the top four people are pulled out of those two organizations. Um, since 9-11, uh, since September 11th, the, generally the sergeants at arms have been people with a long career in law enforcement or in the military. Um, not necessarily in emergency planning or things like that, but people would just sort of understand law enforcement or, or have that sort of background. And then the deputies traditionally have been someone from the institution itself. I'd worked for 25 years on Capitol Hill by the time I left and in a lot of different jobs. And it's important for the two sergeants at arms who usually come from outside the um, outside of Congress to sort of understand or have people around them understand the institution because it's a very complicated place uh, and to, to operate. And there are there's a constant push me, pull you between security, which the security people always want the maximum amount of security because that's the best way to go from a security standpoint. But there are other considerations as well, as well in a democracy, particularly one that, that takes the First Amendment seriously in terms of people's right to protest, freedom of the press and other things. So it's worked out to be a pretty good partnership over the years. So how does, how does one prepare for this role? Um, so it's a patronage position as you described. So it takes, you know, you said the bulk come from law enforcement, but a lot of different backgrounds I would imagine wind up in this position. Mm -hmm. When you got the call, what, what did you say? Oh boy, here are the things I need to do to get ready for this job. Well, the, the initial call I got was to be the deputy sergeant in arms, to be the, the institutional guy. Um, the, the man that was hired, a uh, man by the name of Terry Gaynor, had been the, the head of the, the Illinois State Patrol after a long career in the Chicago Police Department, then was the deputy chief here in Washington, D.C., and had been the, the, the chief of the Capitol Police. So long history in law enforcement. I was picked to be his deputy as the institutional guy and the person who sort of knew how all of the goods and services fit together. After after quite a few years, six or seven years of being deputy, when, when my predecessor retired, I took over and then my deputy uh, was a longtime veteran of the, of the Secret Service. So we still had both functions, but at that point I, I, I moved to the top. Uh, great story about him, well, although he was involved last week, was 
he became the chief of staff to my immediate successor, who was a Republican appointee. And then when, when that man retired, uh, my deputy actually got to be the sergeant at arms. So it's a very nonpartisan organization. Yep. And uh, Mike, Mike Stanger, who has just retired as sergeant at arms, is uh, living proof of how important that is. So let's, let's move to events of last week, and I should timestamp this and say that you and I are recording this conversation about a week after uh, the Capitol was, was stormed by a mob protesting the Electoral College count. Um, but it is before, we are filming this before the inauguration and planned events of more protests this, this weekend. So um, we have the benefit of looking back on, on events that have just happened and um, a little bit of foresight now as, as people are preparing for what comes next. So tell, tell me sort of in normal times during the, the period you were there and you were there 2014, 2015 is, is my memory. You know, what, what's, the cap, what's the normal process for securing and policing the Capitol? And, and talk about the balance between providing relatively open access for citizens um, and securing the safety of members in the, in the facility. Right, That's, you, you've hit on exactly the right balance that always needs to be, that always needs to be thought about. Um, I was there during probably a less politically volatile time, although it's certainly trending in that direction. Frankly, most of my career, I think politics is, has uh, moved in a slightly more coarse and less compromising kind of function, which I think is, is very unfortunate. But th that balance is important. Um, it's, it's important under the First Amendment that people have the right to protest, that, that the Capitol maintain freedom of access to the press. When the House and Senate are in session, the media can be in the galleries. And members are proud of that. Uh, members take it very seriously, as they should. But you got to balance that out against it being a, a you know, probably one of the most prominent terrorist targets in the world. Uh, it's the most visible symbol of democracy that we've got, more so even than the White House. Um, and if we as Americans take seriously our role as being a beacon of freedom and a beacon of democracy, then our symbols are important. So within all of that balance, you can never, what happened last week can never happen. You can't have it overrun. You can't, particularly can't have it run overrun by, by other American citizens. Um, that's about as bad as it gets in a democracy and uh, probably one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever seen. Um, frankly, I don't think that the Capitol Police and the two sergeants at arms and all of the other security planners, including you know other federal, state, and local law enforcement in the region, there are a lot of police forces in this region. I don't honestly think they expected what ended up happening. I think everyone was more or less prayer, prepared for a sort of a rowdy kind of uh, protest. Where well, people on, are going. on that end, what you know, again, maybe perhaps during the time you were there or time sure. since then when you've been an observer, when there is a scheduled protest or march, what's the typical protocol of preparation for the sergeant at arms and the Capitol Police? What would be the typical preparation for an event like that? What, what you would probably see uh, for a big we call them First Amendment events. That's sort of a fancy way of saying a protest. For a big event of that sort, and particularly one that was permitted for the ellipse down near the White House rather than a mile up the road at the Capitol, uh, you would probably see something similar to what you saw the other day, which is a lot of outer perimeter fencing with maybe not a lot of officers behind it, where you saw the bicycle racks, the sort of glorified bicycle racks that people were carrying away, which are primarily designed to more or less be a deterrent for people who are willing to be deterred, where mm -hmm. the officers stand there and say, you can be over there, but you can't be here. They're not designed in a, in a deployment like that to be you know, a barrier that's actually gonna keep people out. So I think where things went wrong is, is that the protest turned into something far more than that with uh, several thousand pretty determined people you know, managing to get through the outer perimeters and, and sort of overrun the building uh, to a certain extent, which is, which is tough. Um, I think there are gonna be a lot of after action reviews, committees of Congress, blue ribbon panels, all of the things, the things that are our stock and trade and our, sure. and our line of work, yours and mine, uh, that are going to determine whether or not they, they miss something in terms of the, the intelligence gathering about, about this group. It's, it's extremely different, difficult stuff. 
Um, yeah, I mean, and I'm, I'm putting you in an unfair position because you were you know, not in the building and you were not part of the sergeant in arms. So you're, you're being asked to observe and comment on that observing of those yep. observations. Were there things that you have gleaned in the, in the week since the event where you thought, okay, there's an error, there's an error, there's an error. What, what were sort of the, the signature mistakes that you, you would highlight? I, I think when it comes right down to it, they were they were probably not deployed the way they would have been if they were expecting a yeah. riot or uh, an insurrection or use whatever term you like. Um, those bicycle racks work great if someone's willing to be deterred. Uh, they just serve as a serious deterrent if there are police and riot gear behind them. The difficulty is, is once you've deployed, you know, 1,400, 1,500 officers, however many were actually out, outside of the buildings, that day, if you don't if you don't have them placed where they need to be for the event you're getting, it's it's a problem. Once once they're to the building or once they're in the building, it's too late. Um, it, we've got things called mutual aid agreements uh, throughout the city with all of the local and federal and state law enforcement, the FBI, the National Guard, and all of these people are pr always prepared to ride to the assistance of, of whoever's having the problem. But it can be a slow deployment. The better the better plan. Is is if you're expecting something like that, you you execute those agreements in advance and you have those people in place. And I just don't think I, that's going to be the big question. Did did the intelligence that they had about who was in this group, what they were doing, and pulling that out of all of the chatter that's constantly going on in the intelligence world, whether or not you should have assumed that? And that's that's going to be the big question and the big answer that needs to come out of this. You said this a little bit earlier, and when referencing the Capitol Police Board, who who has or who or what or could be a variety have sort of executive authority over law enforcement around the Capitol? So, for example, who would make the the calls about what preparation steps need to be put into place? Is it the DC mayor? Is it um, some entity within the Capitol? What who who's got the the control? Right. It, it depends. Um... If it's, if it's just a protest on the U.S. Capitol grounds, um, by and large, the expectation is that the Capitol Police are, are going to handle it. Um, the command structure there is, is the U.S. Capitol Police chief has operational control. Um, if he wants to go too much beyond his own police force, there's usually some form of consultation with the two sergeants at arms to see if they want to invoke those, those wider agreements. Um, and there are reasons for doing that. Um, first of all, you need there needs to be some agreement that, that that needs to be done, and that requires a little bit of discussion. There's also the concern that if you overdo it, um, all of a sudden the Capitol grounds look like a militarized camp, mm -hmm. sort of what you're seeing right now here on the, uh, whatever, the 14th or 15th of, of January, you're seeing the Capitol become. I've never seen anything like that, but it's a unique circumstance. So there is a little bit of consultation there, but the operational decisions on the day of an event like that fall to the Capitol Police Chief. Otherwise, it sort of depends on where the event is. If it's on the ellipse, it's by and large the um, it's by and large the Park Police, usually with the backup of the of the um, of the Metropolitan Police Department here in town and other organizations that are needed. Um, Park Police have a big presence here. The FBI obviously has a huge armed presence here. It's just a matter of what resources are needed at what time. So a lot of people have made comparisons in the press between the Black Lives Matter protests of this, this summer at, on, in the Capitol and, and the preparation, and there's been a lot of photographs um, of, of very well fortified law enforcement officials on steps versus the sort of the absence of that in, in preparation for the Wednesday count of the electoral college votes. Yeah. As somebody who understands the, the, the system and the processes, can you, can you explain why we see those visual differences? And is there, was there a distinct difference in the way that the Capitol Police and others prepared for those two different events? Right. Um, let me let me start by saying that what I thought happened in 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 Washington D.C. Down, down closer to the White House this summer in Black Lives Matter Plaza, which is very close by to the White House, I thought was appalling as an American citizen. Um, I, I understand it. Um, I, in many ways, I think the police were 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 had sort of upgraded to riot gear and other things because of the the thought of violence that they thought were coming from anarchists and the Proud Boys and these other groups, and that they were there was going to be a conflict between different citizen groups. 
that said, I thought it was a terrible look and a terrible way to treat US citizens. Obviously, I've got very strong opinions about what the president did to, to clear Lafayette Square, which was, I thought was even more appalling. Um, it, you know, uh, it's, peaceful protests are supposed to be peaceful protests. If they get out of hand, they become something else. But what I will say about the, about the Capitol Police, which is where I'm probably better suited, is that as near as I could tell, the Capitol Police, again, a mile away from the events of the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer, is that they were in pretty much the same posture as they were during the electoral count, which is they were prepared for sort of a rowdy protest. And most of those protests did not actually end up at the Capitol. But I think the deployment, to my outside eyes, without having any special information, appears that they were prepared the same way both times. The, the, the issue of whether or not black and brown people would have been treated differently coming up the hill, I, I think that's a live issue and I think it's, it's worthy of a lot of discussion, but I, I think it's just a little more complicated than a sim simple issue of a largely white group of rioters versus, versus a largely uh, black and brown groups of, of by and large peaceful protesters. Well, and I, uh, thank you for that clarification. I asked again, because sure. it's, it's hard to discern what really was done, given the, the sort of reporting we, we've seen. And I appreciate right. the comments it's, you made about the different treatment at, at Lafayette Square as opposed to on, on the Capitol steps. I, I'm completely on board with the notion that this is a real problem in our country. Um, yeah. And that one that I think people have strong feelings about. And I understand that. And you know, I'm not making light of it at all. But in the in the sort of the narrow scope of, of what the Capitol Police were doing during those two different times, it's a little more complicated. Yeah. So we we've seen a, a number of people in the last few days in law enforcement around the Capitol either step down or, or be terminated. Do you think this was the, the right move? Is that the, the right sort of in the moment response to this, knowing that there will be further investigations right. and inquiries into what happened? I think it's I think it's the political response in the moment. Uh, obviously, I don't think having two seasoned sergeant at arms with se Secret Service backgrounds uh, who were part of event planning for an event that is controlled by and large by the military district of Washington and the Secret Service. I think losing that expertise this close to the inauguration is probably not great, but I also understand the, the desire of the political leaders, Senator Schumer, Senator McConnell, um, the speaker and the speaker of the house wanting to look, to look decisive. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously the Capitol being overrun by domestic terrorists is a bad look uh, and politicians do what they do. Uh, but I think if you take all of that in context with all of the with so many people from the national security infrastructure at the federal level resigning here in the last week or so, including the acting secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, it, it, it creates a bit of a dearth of talent in some ways. Yeah. I think you and I both know that by and large, the professionals are in charge uh, of, of planning an inaugural and executing an inaugural. And, they, and that maybe the, the heads of all of these organizations aren't absolutely necessary, but it's a little disconcerting, I think. Well, let's, let's use this as a, a pivot to sort of come to the third chapter of this. And this is now drawing not so much on your, your expertise in, in the law enforcement world around securing the Capitol, but more broadly, you've had a, a long career in and around the Senate and, and the legislature. Um, and you, you mentioned earlier, you made reference to the sort of decay of, of bipartisanship norms within the, the, the politics that we live in has become more rancorous. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on, on how we, we move forward from this? And you can start by narrowly focusing on how do we keep the House and the Senate safe, but then, you know, how do we, how do we bring the parties back together and the people back together so, so that we aren't um, attacking each <laughs> other in the midst of a, a, a sacred democratic process? Right. And this is a sacred democratic process that, that goes on without an electoral count. I worked in the Senate for, for 24, 25 years, and I, I barely ever paid attention to that event until, until this year. Um, I, I think there are a variety of things that would be useful over, over a longer period of time to try to get uh, a little more civility back into, into this. And it's, it's going to be hard. Some of the statements people have been making this week are, are, are helpful. You have, uh, you have people in Congress saying that people of the other party were, they feared that they were going to lead uh, some of the insurrectionists 
to them so they could be kidnapped or killed. We've got others saying that that members welcomed um, the day before insurrectionists into the building. Um, there's a reason that, that over the years, particularly in the Senate, you get some of the gobbledygook speak of, well, I would say to my friend, the distinguished junior senator from Kentucky, through the chair, of course, that, that perhaps I disagree with his viewpoint, which is Senate code for you're a jackass and I can prove it. Uh, <laughs> but those, but those, those, those exist, even though they're archaic, to, to sort of force a level of civility onto, onto these men and women, because ultimately there are only 100 of them in the Senate and they've got to be able to work together. So the ability to not call one another names uh, directly on the Senate floor is, is, is important. But it, it's obviated, it's, it's sort of canceled out a lot by the ability, particularly with social media and other venues, to be able to so immediately insult somebody and have them insult you back without really taking into account maybe counting to 10 or waiting till tomorrow or the, all the things that our, our moms and dads taught us when we were kids. So I think, I think social media has, has played a role in all of this, um, but that, that goes largely to people's ability to, or desire, I guess, to be able to sift through information. And uh, it's made things more polarizing. The reward structure is all wrong in politics right now. If you're, um, you're, sitting, in a, you're sitting in Ohio, so let's, let's use Congressman Jordan from a little bit north of Columbus as an example. Pretty polarizing guy, hardcore Republican. I'm not really busting on him for that so much as he doesn't have a care in this world because of gerrymandering, the ability of state legislatures to draw districts that, that are almost impenetrable to the opposite party. Uh, he doesn't worry one bit about being defeated by a Democrat. He's, he, his only worry in the world up there is that he's going to be beaten by, get beaten by someone who's more conservative than he is. Mm -hmm. So that pulls him further to the right, or more importantly, it, it pulls any potential opponent further to the right, which probably pulls the congressman a little bit that way. So you've got to, you end up with a house in, a house in particular, a Senate to a certain degree, where everybody's worried about people to their extreme. So they're pulled that way. And I think it makes it very difficult to compromise. There's no there's no reward in place for compromise the way there has been in the past when you didn't use micro computers for, I mean, big mega computers for micro targeting voters. Uh, members get to pick their voters now, which is not healthy. And they also don't live here. Um, you know, you want to make a deal with somebody, you know, go to dinner with them, you know, and go to your kid's soccer game. You're probably playing with another, their kid would be playing with another kid's soccer um, on, the, on their team together. I think it's just hard to trust somebody who you don't have much in common with. It's a big, broad, diverse country. I mean, people are different um, and regions are different. But you can't trust if you don't get to know. And showing up on, on Tuesday morning and leaving Thursday afternoon, I don't think is a particularly healthy way to run a national, a full-time national legislature. So but again, those are, those are great diagnoses. What, what's the palliative? What's the, what's the cure here? How, how do we address some of those, those issues? I think, you, I think probably the biggest issue I have where I think members actually have a certain level of control or people in politics have a certain level of control is to do some things that states are experimenting with. If, if you go with a nonpartisan commission to set congressional seats where you, where you have, have hundreds rather than mere dozens of seats that are actually competitive, where you actually have to fight for moderate voters or voters that represent, you know, the big squishy middle here, probably is 60% of our electorate. And then, you know, crazies off to the left, crazies off to the right. Um, but if, if you've got a district where you have some hope of having to appeal to the other side a bit, I think you probably get members who either behave in a more, in a more um, welcoming fashion or are, are replaced by members who are prepared to operate that way. It just helps with the, re it helps with the risk reward. Um, there's just no reward for taking the risk right now. And frankly, I, I don't know what's to be done about social media. I don't, I don't hear any national legislative things that are, that are brilliant, but, and I don't know that the, I don't, I don't know exactly what the answer is, but people need to tone it down. I mean, it's just, you can't run an entire government by, by insulting conservatives or owning the libs or whatever the phrase is. I, it just, you know, the people are sent here to represent and, and to lead. And I think, 
I think that's gotten harder and harder to do. I think it's hard, members find it harder and harder to actually come out and say something that their constituents disagree with. Uh, and I think I, I am a Democrat. I, I don't make any secret of it, but I think I think there are an awful lot of members who voted against certification of the Electoral College last week who know very well that that President Biden, Vice, that President elect Biden beat Donald Trump. We're just too afraid of their own constituents and their ability to communicate quickly and angrily and 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 stir up trouble for them. That it's just it becomes almost not worth it. So I don't know what the answer there is. That's probably a great student question, <laughs> and there's a great thesis in there somewhere, but. You know, somehow or another, we need to get some of the air out of this bubble. And it's because it's, we, I think we've arrived in a relatively dangerous time. And I don't know, we know that, that President Trump is unlikely to leave by saying, well, I gave it my best shot, but yeah, I lost. I mean, that's just, it's not in his nature. But I think we've entered a, a dangerous time where we really do have people viewing this through two different set of fact patterns. Only one of us is actually fact driven. Um, and it goes back and forth between the parties. It's not completely a shot at, at most of the Republican Party, but it's certainly a shot at the president. So with that sterling and insightful diagnosis, let's, let's, <laughs> let's pull this to a close. And I'll, <laughs> I'll just say thank you, Drew, for uh, first helping us understand uh, that challenge of, of keeping the Capitol open, um, but also fundamentally safe and protecting both the, the members and, and the democratic process. And then also, thank you for your continued public service. You're, you're a model of, of someone who's uh, done a lot of different things over their career, but the through line is uh, always a commitment to, to serving the, the country and, and, and its people. So uh, on behalf of the Glenn College, thank you for, for making us all proud. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I've been, I've been very, very lucky in my career, but I got to tell you, my master's degree that I, uh, I earned at Ohio State has served me better than the law degree I picked up a number of years later. Um, it's, it's been a, it was a great education for what I've been lucky enough to be able to do. So for those of you who are watching this thinking, oh, I don't know, graduate school, maybe it's not for me. Get off the fence, enroll. <laughs> we'll, we'll absolutely finish there. Thank you. Thank you, Drew, and stay safe in these coming days and weeks. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you.